So far, I've introduced the idea of the derivative and then the technique of limits. In this week, I get to finally connect those two by using limits to properly and formally define the derivative. To get there, I want to go back to motivation and talk about what rate of change actually measures. I'm going to cover two motivating problems in this video, one for rate of change and another for area. These two motivating problems will lead to the definitions of the derivative and the integral, both of which require the theory of limits that we spent the last two weeks working on. So let me start with the idea of rate of change. If I think of the position of an object, the rate of change, the derivative, its velocity. So in terms of movement, finding derivatives is the same as finding velocities. Here is a graph of a linear function p of t, where p is position and t is velocity. This function is p equals a t for some constant a. In this function, the position is increasing consistently as time passes. This is a constant velocity situation. What is that velocity? Well, velocity is how much distance the object moves per unit time. The change in distance over the change in time. The change in distance in position is delta p, the rise of the slope. The change in time, delta t, is the run of the slope, and the ratio is the slope. So if an object moves with constant velocity, its position um, graph is a straight line, and the slope of that line is the speed, the velocity of the object. I can calculate the slope of straight lines. This is a problem that algebra can solve. But now consider a nonlinear function, a function whose graph is not a straight line. What is the rate of change, the velocity of this graph? Since it isn't a straight line, it doesn't have a single slope to understand. How do I manage this? Well, for any point in the function, I can draw a straight line which just brushes up against the function. This is called the tangent line to the function. This has little directly to do with the trig function tangent, so sorry for the confusion in the terminology here. This tangent is a straight line. It has a slope. It has a well-defined velocity. To understand the velocity of the nonlinear function at a point, I can use this tangent line. Its slope will be the velocity of this more complicated function, at least at this point. At other points, there are other tangent lines with other slopes, so other velocities. This is precisely the thing that algebra has trouble with, this dynamic situation where the velocity is always changing. And this is what I want to solve. I want to calculate the slopes of tangent lines to graphs of functions. This is the derivative, the rate of change measured by the slope of a tangent line. So how do I do this? Well, the standard setup for all the major calculus definitions is to set up an approximation process and then take the limit of the process. I need to set up an approximation. Do an approximation. Instead, instead of tangent lines, I'm going to use secant lines. Again, this is not directly connected to the trig function secant. Sorry. A secant line is a line that crosses the graph of the function twice. Since it crosses twice, there are two points, and as I review, reviewed in the first week of the term, if I have two points, I can find the equation of the line, and in particular, its slope. So here is the approximation process. Say I want to calculate the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1. I take two points, x equals 0 and x equals 1, to get a secant line. Then the slope is the change in y, the rise, over the change in x, the run. The change in y is the change in the function, so f of 1 minus f of 0. The change in x is just the difference of the inputs, 1 minus 0. Let's say, for example, that I get a slope of 1 for some particular function with these two points. Then, say I move the first point a bit closer to x equals 1, say x equals a quarter instead of x equals 0. I still have two points, so I still have a secant line, so I can still get a slope. The difference is now f of 1 minus f of 1 quarter, and the denominator is 1 minus 1 quarter. And again, for some function, let's say this works out to a slightly steeper slope, say 5 quarters. I keep going. I move the first point closer to the second, x equals 1 half, and x equals 1 now. I calculate the slope, f of 1 minus f of 1 half over 1 minus 1 half. This is a bit steeper again, and let's say it works out to 3 halves. And now I get even closer, x equals 3 quarters, and calculate the slope in the same way. And this is a bit steeper again, say 7 quarters. 
what I want to do is I want to take the limit of this process. In the end, I want to get the actual tangent line, finding it by moving the first point closer and closer to the second. In the end, I want the slope of this line with only one point, this tangent line. And in the drawing, I want to reach slope 2 from the approximation of these slightly steeper and steeper slopes. So here's the whole process in one slide. I have four lines that are getting closer and closer to the tangent line, and I can calculate their slope. In the limit, I want to find this fifth line, which is the actual tangent line, with its actual slope. The next steps, the formal definition, will follow in the next video. For now, I hope you understand that I care about the slope of tangent lines as a way to calculate velocity, and that I can set up an approximation with secant lines to get close to that slope. If there is a limit of the approximation, that should solve the problem. Now I have a second motivating problem. Even though I won't finish this particular story for a few weeks, I want to start it now because of the strong parallel with the tangent lines that I've just done. I was just working on the velocity problem. If I have a function of position, what is the velocity? If I always know where I am, then how fast am I going? But I can consider the opposite problem. If I always know my velocity, can I figure out how far I've traveled? Let me call this the distance traveled problem. It's another natural problem in the mathematics of movement. For the velocity problem, I started with constant velocity, where the algebra was able to solve without trouble. And I do the same here. So here is the graph of velocity in terms of time. If velocity is constant, this graph is a straight horizontal line. So let's say the velocity is some number c in units of distance per units of time. If I travel for t naught units of time, well then how far have I gone? Well, if I travel at a speed c, say kilometers per hour, and have traveled, say, t naught hours, then the distance is just the product c times t naught. At 60 kilometers an hour for three hours, I've gone 180 kilometers, the product of 60 times three. The distance traveled problem is solved by the area of this square. Like the slope for the velocity problem, this is a nice geometric interpretation. To know distance traveled, I need the area of the region under the velocity function. Algebra is fine with the area of squares which is what I get for constant velocity, but what if the velocity is not constant? Here is a velocity function, v of t, and it changes, sometimes going slower and sometimes going faster. This is, again, the dynamic situation that algebra can't really handle. I need something more here. However, the idea is still the same. The distance traveled is the area under the velocity function. I need to calculate the area under graphs of functions. For the velocity problem, the tangent line was the geometric solution, but for the distance traveled problem, the area under the graph is the geometric solution. So my approach is the same. Make an approximation process and see if I can take the limit. Algebra can do approximation, and I hopefully can use limits to see whether those approximations are going to work. I approximate the area under the graph of a function by rectangles, since the area of a rectangle is easy to calculate. So here is an approximation with six rectangles. For secant lines, I improved the approximation by moving the first point closer and closer to the second. Here, I improved the approximation by using more rectangles. Here is an approximation with 12 rectangles. The error, the little piece where the graph and the rectangles don't line up, is getting smaller. By adding more rectangles, I get a better and better approximation. This sets up an approximation process to solve the distance traveled problem. And it'll be a couple of weeks before I finish this story, but there will be a limit that understands this approximation process. Let me recap before I finish here. I have two problems which naturally arise from understanding motion. If I know position, what is velocity? Or if I know velocity, what is position? Both problems have a geometric interpretation, tangent lines and areas under graphs. Both geometric interpretations have approximations, secant lines or approximation of areas by rectangles. And eventually, both approximations will be understood by limits to give one of the core definitions of calculus. And this is why I needed limits in the first place. Finally, 
Let me note that these are physics problems, motion of an object, as opposed to the more biological problems I had discussed earlier, growth and decline of populations. I really like biology for a motivator since the dynamics of population are a really good place to start seeing the utility of calculus. However, the physics is more historical. Calculus was originally built to solve physics problems, and the other applications to other types of rates of change came much later in the history of the discipline.